Chapter Twenty, Part One of Mr. Prohack by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Twenty, The Silent Tower. One. The fount of riches and the terror of the departments, clothed in the latest pattern of sumptuous pyjamas, lay in the midst of his magnificent and spacious bed, and with the shaded electric globe over his brow gazed at the splendours of the vast bedroom which Eve had allotted to him. It was full, but not too full, of the finest directoire furniture, and the walls were covered with all manner of engravings and water-colours. Evidently this apartment had been the lair of the real owner and creator of the great home. Mr. Prohack could appreciate the catholicity and sureness of taste which it displayed. He liked the cornice as well as the form of the dressing-table, and the Cumberland landscape of C. J. Holmes, as well as the large Piranesi etching of an imaginary prison, which latter particularly interested him, because it happened to be an impression between two states, a detail which none but a true amateur could savour. The prison depicted was a terrible place of torment, but it was beautiful, and the view of it made Mr. Prohack fancy, very absurdly, that he too was in prison, just as securely as if he had been bolted and locked therein. His eye ranged about the room, and saw nothing that was not lovely and that he did not admire. Yet he derived little or no authentic pleasure from what he beheld, partly because it was the furnishing of a prison, and partly because he did not own it. He had often preached against the mania for owning things, but now, and even more clearly than when he had sermonized Paul Spinner, he perceived, and hated to perceive, that ownership was probably an essential ingredient of most enjoyments. The man, foolishly priding himself on being a philosopher, was indeed a fleshly mass of strange inconsistencies. More important, he was losing the assurance that he would sleep soundly that night. He could not drag his mind off his co-heiress and his co-heir. The sense of humiliation of being intimately connected and classed with them would not leave him. He felt himself, absurdly once again, to be mysteriously associated with them in a piece of sharp practice or even of knavery. They constituted another complication of his existence. He wanted to disown them, and never to speak to them again, but he knew that he could not disown them. He was living in gorgeousness for the sole reason that he and they were in the same boat. Eve came in, opening the door cautiously at first, and then rushing forward as soon as she saw that the room was not in darkness. He feared for an instant that she might upbraid him for deserting her. But no, triumphant happiness sat on her forehead, and affectionate concern for him was in her eyes. She plumped down, in her expensive radiance, on the bed by his side. "'Well,' said he, "'I'm so glad you decided to go to bed,' said she. "'You must be tired, and late nights don't suit you. I just slipped away for a minute to see if you were all right, are you?' She puckered her shining brow exactly as of old, and bent and kissed him as of old one of her best kisses. But the queer fellow, though touched by her attention, did not like her being so glad that he had gone to bed. The alleged philosopher would have preferred her to express some dependence upon his manly support in what was for her a tremendous event. "'I feel I shall sleep,' he lied. "'I'm sure you will, darling,' she agreed. "'Don't you think it's all been a terrific success?' she asked naively. He answered, smiling. I'm dying to see the daily picture to-morrow. I think I shall tell the newsagent in future only to deliver it on the days when you're in it. Don't be silly, she said, too pleased with herself, however, to resent his irony. She was clothed in mail that night against all his shafts. He admitted, what he had always secretly known, that she was an elementary creature. She would have been just at home in the Stone Age as in the twentieth century, and perhaps more at home. Was Lady Masculum equally elementary? No? Yes? Still, Eve was necessary to him. Only up to a short while ago she had been his complement, whereas now he appeared to be her complement. He, the philosopher and the source of domestic wisdom, was fully aware, in a superior and lofty manner, that she was the eternal child, deceived by toys, gewgaws, and illusions. Nevertheless, 
he was, he was only her complement, the indispensable husband and payer out. She was succeeding without any brainwork from him. He noticed that she was not wearing the pearls he had given her. No doubt she had merely forgotten at the last moment to put them on. She was continually forgetting them and leaving them about. But this negligent woman was the organiser-in-chief of the great soiree. Well, if it had succeeded, she was lucky. "'I must run off,' said she, starting up, busy, proud, falsely calm, the general of a victorious army as the battle draws to a close. She embraced him again, and he actually felt comforted. She was gone. "'As I grow older,' he reflected, "'I am hanged if I don't understand life less and less.' He was listening to the distant rhythm of the music when he mistily comprehended that there was no music, and that the sounds in his ear were not musical. He could not believe that he had been asleep and had awakened, but the facts were soon too much for his delusion, and he said with the air of a discoverer, "'I have been asleep,' and turned on the light. There were voices and footsteps in the corridors or on the landing, whispers, loud and yet indistinct talking, tones indicating that the speakers were excited, if not frightened and that their thoughts had been violently wrenched away from the pursuit of pleasure. His watch showed two o'clock. The party was over, the last automobile had departed, and probably even the tireless Eliza Fiddle was asleep in her new home. Next Mr. Prohack noticed that the door of his room was ajar. He had no anxiety. Rather, he felt quite gay and careless the more so as he had wakened up with the false sensation of complete refreshment produced by short, heavy slumber. He thought, "'Whatever has happened, I have had and shall have nothing to do with it, and they must deal with the consequences themselves as best they can.' And, as a measure of precaution against being compromised, he switched off the light. He heard Eve's voice, surprisingly near his door. "'I simply daren't tell him. No, I daren't. The voice was considerably agitated, but he smiled maliciously to himself, thinking, "'It can't be anything very awful, because she only talks in that strain when it's nothing at all. She loves to pretend she's afraid of me. And moreover, I can't believe there's anything on earth she daren't tell me.' He heard another voice, reasoning in reply, that resembled Mimi's. "'Hadn't that girl gone home yet?' And he heard Sissy's voice, and Charlie's but for him all these were inarticulate. Then his room was filled with swift, blinding light. Somebody had put a hand through the doorway and turned the light on. It must be Eve. It was Eve, scared and distressed, but still in complete war-paint. "'I'm so relieved you're awake, Arthur,' she said, approaching the bed as though she anticipated the bed would bite her. "'I'm not awake. I'm asleep, officially. My poor girl, you've ruined the finest night I was ever going to have in all my life.' She ignored his complaint absolutely. "'Arthur,' she said, her face twitching in every direction, and all her triumph falling from her, "'Arthur, I've lost my pearls. They've gone. Someone must have taken them.' Mr. Brohack's reaction to this piece of more than midnight news was to break into hearty and healthy laughter. He appeared to be genuinely diverted, and when Eve protested against such an attitude, he said, "'My child, anything that strikes you as funny after being wakened up at two in the morning is very funny, very funny indeed. How can I help laughing?' Eve thereupon began to cry weakly. "'Come here, please,' said he. And she came and sat on the bed, but how differently from the previous visit. She was now beaten by circumstances, and she turned for aid to his alleged more powerful mind and deeper wisdom. In addition to being amused, the man was positively happy, because he was no longer a mere compliment. So he comforted her, and put his hands on her shoulders. "'Don't worry,' said he gently. "'And after all, I'm not surprised the necklace has been pinched.' "'Not surprised, Arthur?' "'No. You collect here half the notorious smart people in London. Fifty percent of them go through one or other of the courts. Five percent of them end by being detected criminals.' and goodness knows what percent end by being undetected criminals. Possibly two percent treat marriage seriously, and possibly one percent is not in debt. That's the atmosphere you created, and it's an atmosphere in which pearls are apt to melt away. Hence I am not surprised, and you mustn't be. Said it would be interesting to know how the things melted away. 
Were you wearing them? Of course I was wearing them. There was nothing finer here tonight. That I saw. You hadn't got them on when you came in here before? Hadn't I? said Eve, thoughtful. No, you hadn't. Then why didn't you tell me? Eve demanded suddenly, almost fiercely, through her tears, withdrawing her shoulders from his hands. Well, said Mr. Prohack, I thought you'd know what you'd got on, or what you hadn't got on. I think you might have told me. If you had, perhaps the— Mr. Prohack put his hand over her mouth. Stop, said he. My sweet child, I can save you a lot of trouble. It's all my fault. If I hadn't been a miracle of stupidity, the necklace would never have disappeared. This point being agreed to, let us go on to the next. When did you find out your sad loss? It was Miss Winstock who asked me what I'd done with my necklace. I put my hand to my throat, and it was gone. It must have come undone. Didn't you say to me a fortnight or so ago that the little safety chain had gone wrong? Did I? said Eve innocently. Did you have the safety chain repaired? I was going to have it done tomorrow. You see, if I'd sent it to be done today, then I couldn't have worn the necklace tonight, could I? Very true, Mr. Brock concurred. But who could have taken it? Ah, are you sure that it isn't lying on the floor somewhere? Every place where I've been has been searched thoroughly. It's quite certain that it must have been picked up and pocketed. Then, by a man, seeing that women have no pockets except their husbands, I'm beginning to feel quite like a detective already. By the way, lady, the notion of giving a reception in a house like this without a detective disguised as a guest was rather grotesque. But of course I had detectives— Eve burst out. I had two private ones. I thought one ought to be enough. But as soon as the agents saw the inventory of knack knick knacks and things, they advised me to have two men. One of them's here still. In fact, he's waiting to see you. The Scotland Yard people are very annoying. They've refused to do anything until morning. That Eve should have engaged detectives was something of a blow to the masculine superiority of Mr. Prohack. However, he kept himself in countenance by convincing himself in secret that she had not thought of the idea. The idea must have been given to her by another person, probably Mimi, who nevertheless was also a woman. "'And do you seriously expect me to interview a detective in the middle of the night?' demanded Mr. Prohack. "'He said he should like to see you. But, of course, if you don't feel equal to it, my poor boy, I'll tell him so.' "'What does he want to see me for? I've nothing to do with it, and I know nothing.' "'He says that as you bought the necklace he must see you, and the sooner the better.' This new aspect of the matter seemed to make Mr. Prohack rather thoughtful. 3. Eve brought in to her husband, who had improved his moral stamina and his physical charm by means of the finest of his dressing-gowns, a dark, thin young man, clothed to marvellous perfection, with a much-loved moustache, and looking as fresh as if he was just going to a party. Mr. Prohack, of course, recognised him as one of the guests. "'Good morning,' said Mr. Prohack. "'So you are the detective?' Ah, uh, "'Yes, sir,' answered the detective, formally. "'Do you know, all the evening, I was under the impression that you were the first secretary to the Czechoslovakian legation?' "'No, sir,' answered the detective, formally. "'Well, well, I think there is a proverb to the effect that appearances are deceptive.' "'Is there indeed, sir?' said the detective, with unshaken gravity. "'In our business we think that appearances ought to be deceptive.' "'Now, talking of your business,' Mr. Prohack remarked, with one of his efforts to be very persuasive, "'what about this unfortunate affair?' "'Yes, sir, what about it?' The detective looked askance at Eve. "'I suppose there's no doubt the thing's been stolen. By the way, sit on the end of the bed, will you? Then you'll be near me.' "'Yes, sir,' said the detective, sitting down. "'There is no doubt that the necklace has been removed by someone, either for a nefarious purpose or for a joke.' "'Ha! Huh, a joke?' meditated Mr. Prohack aloud. "'It certainly hasn't been taken for a joke,' said Eve warmly. "'Nobody that I know well enough for them to play such a trick would dream of playing it.' "'Then,' said Mr. Prohack, "'we are left all alone with the nefarious purpose. "'I had a sort of a notion that I should meet the nefarious purpose, and here it is. "'I suppose there's little hope.' "'Well, sir, you know what happens to a stone and pearl necklace. "'The pearls are separated.' They can be sold at once, one at a time, or they can be kept for years, and then sold. Pearls, except the very finest, leave no trace when they get a fair start. 
"'What I can't understand,' Eve exclaimed, "'is how it could have dropped off without me noticing it.' "'Oh, I can easily understand that,' said Mr. Prohack, with a peculiar intonation. "'I've known ladies lose even their hair without noticing anything,' said the detective firmly, "'not to mention other items.' "'But without anybody else noticing it either?' Eve pursued her own train of thought. "'Somebody did notice it,' said the detective, writing on a small piece of paper. "'Who?' "'The person who took the necklace.' "'Well, of course I know that,' Eve spoke impatiently. "'But who can it be? I feel sure it's one of the new servants, or one of the hard waiters.' "'In our business, madam, we usually suspect servants and waiters last.' Then, turning round very suddenly, he demanded, "'Who's that at the door?' Eve, startled, moved towards the door, and in the same instant the detective put a small piece of paper into Mr. Prohack's lap. Mr. Prohack read on the paper, "'Should like to see you alone.' The detective picked up the paper again. Mr. Prohack laughed joyously within himself. "'There's nobody at the door,' said Eve. "'How you frightened me!' "'Marion,' said Mr. Prohack, fully inspired, "'Take my keys off there, will you, and go to my study and unlock the top right-hand drawer of the big desk. You'll find a blue paper at the top of the back. Bring it to me. I don't know which is the right key, but you'll soon see.' And when Eve, eager with her important mission, had departed, Mr. Brohack continued to the detective. "'Pretty good, that, eh, for an improvisation. The key of that drawer isn't on that ring at all. And even if she does manage to open the drawer, there's no blue paper in there at all. she be quite some time.' The detective stared at Mr. Prohack in a way to reduce his facile self-satisfaction. "'What I wish to know from you, sir, personally, is whether you want this affair to be hushed up or not.' "'Hushed up?' repeated Mr. Prohack, to whom the singular suggestion opened out new and sinister avenues of speculation. "'Why hushed up?' "'Most of the cases we deal with have to be hushed up sooner or later,' answered the detective. "'I only wanted to know where I was.' "'How interesting your work must be,' observed Mr. Prohack, with quick, sympathetic enthusiasm. "'I expect you love it. How did you get into it? Did you serve an apprenticeship? I've often wondered about you, private detective. It's a marvellous life.' "'I got into it through meeting a man in the Piccadilly Tube. As for liking it, I shouldn't like any work.' "'But some people love their work.' "'So I've heard,' said the detective sceptically. "'Then I take it you do want the matter smothered?' "'But you've telephoned to Scotland Yard about it,' said Mr. Prohack. "'We can't hush it up after that.' "'I told them,' replied the detective grimly, indicating with his head the whole world of the house. "'I told them I was telephoning to Scotland Yard. But I wasn't. I was telephoning to our head office. Then am I to take it you want to find out all you can, but you want it smothered?' And "'Not at all. I have no reason for hushing anything up.' The detective gazed at him in a harsh, lower-middle-class way, and Mr. Brohack quailed a little before that glance. "'Would you please tell me where you bought the necklace?' Oh, "'I really forget. Somewhere in Bond Street.' "'Oh, I see,' said the detective. "'A necklace of forty-nine pearls, over half of them stated to be as big as peas, and it slipped your memory where you bought it.' The detective yawned. "'And I'm afraid I haven't kept the receipt either,' said Mr. Brohack. I have an idea the firm went out of business soon after I bought the necklace. At least, I seem to remember the noticing the shop shut up and then opening again of something else. "'No jeweller ever goes out of business in Bond Street,' said the detective, and yawned once more. "'Well, Miss Prohack, I don't think I need trouble you any more to-night. If you or Mrs. Prohack will call at our head office during the course of to-morrow, you shall have our official report, and if anything really fresh should turn up, I'll telephone you immediately.' "'Good night, Mr. Prohack.' The man bowed rather awkwardly as he rose from the bed, and departed. "'That chap thinks there's something fishy between Eve and me,' reflected Mr. Prohack. "'I wonder whether there is.' But he was still in high spirits when Eve came back into the room. "'The sleuth-hound has fled,' said he. "'I must have given him something to think about.' "'I've tried all the keys, and none of them will fit,' Eve complained. "'And yet you're always grumbling at me for not keeping my keys in order. "'If you wanted to show him the blue paper, why have you let him go?' "'My dear,' said Mr. Brock, "'I didn't let him go. He did not consult me, but merely and totally went.' "'And what is the blue paper?' 
Eve demanded. Well, supposing it was the receipt for what I paid for the pearls. Oh, I see. But how would that help? It wouldn't help, Mr. Brahack replied. My broken butterfly, you may as well know the worst. The sleuth hound doesn't hold out much hope. Yes, said Eve, and you seem delighted that I've lost my pearls. I know what it is. You think it would be a lesson for me, and you love people to have lessons. Why, anybody might lose a necklace. True, ships are wrecked, and necklaces are lost, and Nelson even lost his eye. And I'm sure it was one of the servants. My child, you can be just as happy without a pearl necklace as with one. You really aren't a woman who cares for vulgar display. Moreover, in times like these, when society seems to be toppling over, what is a valuable necklace except a source of worry? Felicity is not to be obtained by the— Eve screamed. Arthur! If you go on like that, I shall run straight out of the house and take cold in the square. I will give you another necklace, Mr. Prevac answered this threat. And as her face did not immediately clear, he added, And a better one. I don't want another one, said Eve. I'd sooner be without one. I know it was all my own fault. But you're horrid, and I can't make you out, and I never could make you out. I never did know where I am with you. And I believe you're hiding something from me. I believe you picked up the necklace, and that's why you sent the detective away." Mr. Brohack had to assume his serious voice, which always carried conviction to Eve, and which he had never misused. "'I haven't picked your necklace up. I haven't seen it, and I know nothing about it.' Then he changed again. "'And if you'll kindly step forward and kiss me good morning, I'll try to snatch a few moments' unconsciousness.' Four. Mr. Brahack's life at this wonderful period of his career as a practising philosopher at grips with the great world seemed to be a series of violent awakenings. He was awakened with even increased violence at about eight o'clock the next, or rather the same, morning, and he would have been awakened earlier if the servants had got up earlier. The characteristic desire of the servants to rise early had, however, been enfeebled by the jolly vigils of the previous night. It was, of course, Eve who rushed into him. Nobody else would have dared. She had hastily cast about her plumpness the transformed Chinese gown, which had the curious appearance of a survival from some former incarnation. "'Arthur!' she called, and positively shook the victim. "'Arthur!' Mr. Bragg looked at her, dazed by the electric light which she had ruthlessly turned on over his head. "'There's a woman being caught in the area. She's a fat woman, and she must have been there all night.' The cook locked the area gate, and the woman was too fat to climb over. Brules put her in the servants' hall and fastened the door. What do you think we ought to do first? Send for the police, or telephone to Mr. Crude? He's the detective you saw last night. "'If she's been in the area all night, you'd better put her to bed and give her some hot brandy and water,' said Mr. Prohack. "'Arthur, please, please be serious,' Eve supplicated. I'm being as serious as a man can who has been disturbed in this pleasant fashion by a pretty woman," said Mr. Brohack, attentively examining the ceiling. "'You go and look after the fat lady. Supposing she dies from exposure? There'd have to be an inquest. Do you wish to be mixed up in an inquest? What does she want? Whatever it is, give it to her and let her go, and wake me up next week. I feel I can sleep a bit." "'Arthur, you'll drive me mad. Can't you see that she must be connected with the necklace business? She must be. It's as clear as daylight. Ah, breathed Mr. Brohack, thoughtfully interested. I'd forgotten the necklace business. Yes, well, I hadn't, said Eve, rather shrewishly. I had not. And quite possibly she may be mixed up in the necklace business, Mr. Brohack admitted. She may be a clue. Look here, don't let's tell anybody outside, not even Mr. Crude. Let's detect for ourselves. It'll be the greatest fun. What does she say for herself? She said she was waiting outside the house to catch a young lady with a snub nose going away from my reception. Mimi Winstock, of course. Why Mimi Winstock? Well, hasn't she got a turned-up nose? And she didn't go away from my reception. She's sleeping here, Eve rejoined triumphantly. And what else does the fat woman say? She says she won't say anything else except to Mimi Winstock. Well, then, wake up, Mimi, as you wakened her, me, and sent her to the servants' hall, wherever that is. I've never seen it myself. Eve shook her somewhat tousled head vigorously. Certainly not. I don't trust Miss Mimi Winstock, not one bit. 
I'm not going to let those two meet until you've had a talk with the burglar. Me? Mr. Prohack protested. Yes, you. Seeing that you don't want me to send for the police, something has to be done and somebody has to do it. And I never did trust that Mimi Winstock, and I'm very sorry she's gone to Charlie. That was a great mistake. However, it's got nothing to do with me. She shrugged her agreeable shoulders. But my necklace has got something to do with me. Mr. Prohack thought. What would Lady Massillon do in such a crisis? And how would Lady Massillon look in a dressing-gown and her hair down? I shall never know. Meanwhile, he liked Eve's demeanour, its vivacity and simplicity. I'm afraid I'm still in love with her, the strange fellow reflected, and said aloud, You better kiss me. I shall have an awful headache if you don't. And Eve reluctantly kissed him, with the look of a martyr on her face. Within a few minutes Mr. Prohack had dismissed his wife, and was descending the stairs in a dressing-gown which rivalled hers. The sight of him in the unknown world of the basement floor, as he searched unaided for the servants' hall, created an immense sensation, far greater than he had anticipated. A nice young girl, whom he had never seen before, and as to whom he knew nothing except that she was probably one of his menials, was so moved that she nearly had an accident with a tea-tray which she was carrying. "'What is your name?' Mr. Prohack benignly asked. "'Selina, sir.' "'Where are you going with that tea-tray and newspaper?' "'I was just taking it upstairs to Machin, sir. She's not feeling well enough to get up yet, sir.' Mr. Prohack comprehended the greatness of the height to which Machin had ascended. Machin, a parlour-maid, drinking tea in bed, and being served by a lesser creature, who evidently regarded Machin as a person of high power and importance on earth. Mr. Prohack saw that he was unacquainted with the fundamental realities of life in Manchester Square. "'Well,' said he, "'you can get some more tea for Machin. Give me that.' He took the tray. Oh, "'No, no, you can keep the newspaper.' The paper was the daily picture. As he held the tray with one hand and gave the paper back to Selina with the other, his eye caught the headlines. "'West End Sensation. Mrs. Prohack's Pearls Pinched.' He paled but he was too proud a man to withdraw the paper again. No doubt the daily picture would reach him through the customary channels after Machin had done with it, accompanied by the usual justifications about the newsboy being late. He could wait. "'Which is the servant's hall?' said he. Selina's manner changed to positive alarm, as she indicated, in the dark subterranean corridor, the door that was locked on the prisoner. Not merely the presence of Mr. Prohack had thrilled the basement floor, there was a thrill greater even than that, and Mr. Prohack, by demanding the door of the servants' hall, was intensifying the thrill to the last degree. The key was on the outside of the door, which he unlocked. Within, the electric light was still burning in the obscure door. The prisoner, who sprang up from a chair and curtsied fearsomely at the astonishing spectacle of Mr. Prohack, was fat in a superlative degree, and her obesity gave her a middle-aged air to which she probably had no right by the almanac. She looked quite forty, and might well have been not more than thirty. She made a typical London figure of the nondescript industrial class. It is inadequate to say that her shabby black-trimmed bonnet, her shabby sham fur coat half-hiding a large dubious apron, her shabby frayed black skirt and her shabby immense amorphous boots, it is inadequate to say that these things seem to have come immediately out of a tenth-rate pawn-shop. The woman herself seemed to have come, all of a piece with her garments, out of a tenth-rate pawn-shop. The entity of her was at any rate homogeneous. It sounded no discord. She did nothing so active as to weep, but tears, obeying the law of gravity, oozed out of her small eyes, and ran in zigzags, unsummoned and unchecked, down her dark-red cheeks. "'Oh, sir,' she mumbled, in a wee, scarcely articulate voice, "'I'm a respectable woman, so help me God.' "'You shall be respected,' said Mr. Rohack. "'Sit down and drink some of this tea, and eat the bread and butter. "'No, I don't want you to say anything just yet. "'No, nothing at all.' When she got the tea into the cup, she poured it into the saucer, and blew it on it, and began to drink loudly. After two sips she plucked at a piece of bread and butter, conveyed it into her mouth, and before doing anything further to it, syrupped up some more tea. And in this way she went on, 
Her table manners convinced Mr. Prefect that her claim to respectability was authentic. "'And now,' said Mr. Prefect, gazing through the curtained window at the blank wall that ended above him at the edge of the pavement, so as not to embarrass her, "'will you tell me why you spent the night in my area?' "'Because someone locked the gate on me, sir, when I was hiding under the shed where the dustbins are.' "'I quite see,' said Mr. Prefect, "'I quite see. But why did you go down into the area? Were you begging, or what?' "'Me begging, sir,' she exclaimed, and ceased to cry, fortified by the tonic of aroused pride. "'No, of course you weren't begging,' said Mr. Prefect. "'You may have given to beggars.' "'That I have, sir,' she cried again. "'But you don't beg. I quite see. Then what?' "'It's no use me trying to tell you, sir. You won't believe me.' Her voice was extraordinarily thin and weak, and seldom achieved anything that could fairly be called pronunciation. "'I shall,' said Mr. Prohack. "'I'm a great believer. You try me. You'll see.' "'It's like this. I, I was converted last night, and that's where the trouble began, if, if it's the last word I ever speak.' "'Theology,' murmured Mr. Prohack, turning to look at her and marvelling at the romantic quality of basements. There was a mission on at the Methodist in Paddington Street, and you know I went. It seems strange to me to be going into a Methodist, seeing how I'm so friendly with Mr. Milcher. Uh, who is Mr. Milcher? M Milcher's the sexton at St. Nicodemus, sir. Oh, I should say sacristan. They call him sacristan instead of sexton, because St. Nicodemus is high, as I dare say you know, sir, living so close. Mr. Prowack was conscious of a slight internal shiver which he could not explain, unless it might be due to a subconscious premonition of unpleasantness to come. "'I know that I live close to St. Nicodemus,' he replied, "'very close, too close. But I don't know how high St. Nicodemus was. However, I am interrupting you.' He perceived with satisfaction that his gift of inspiring people with confidence was not failing him on this occasion. "'Well, sir, as I was saying, it, it might, as you might say, seem, seem strange to me popping like that into the Methodist, seeing what Milcher's views are. But my mother was a Methodist in Canterbury, a great place for dissenters, sir, North London, you know, sir, and they do say blood's thicker than water. So there I was, and the, the mission are going on, and as soon as ever I got inside that chapel, I knew I was done in. I never felt so all overish in all my days, and before I knew where I was I had found salvation.' and I was so happy you couldn't believe. I come out of that Methodist as free-like as ever as I was coming out of a hospital. God knows I've been in a hospital often enough for my varicose veins in the lakes, sir. You might almost have guessed I had them, sir, from the kind way you told me to sit down, sir. And I was just wondering how I should break it to Milcher, sir, but because me passing St. Nicodemus made me think of him, not as I'm not always thinking of him, and I looked up at the clock. You know it's the only illuminated church clock in the district, sir, the clock was just on eleven, sir, and I waited for it to strike, sir, and it didn't strike. My feet was rooted to the spot, sir, but no, that clock didn't strike, and then all of a sudden it rushed over me about that young woman asking me all about the tower and the clock, and telling me as her young man was so interested in church towers, and he wanted to go up, and would I lend her the keys at the tower door, because Milcher always gives me the bunch of church keys to keep for him while he goes into the horse and groom public house, sir, and he not caring to take church keys into a public house. He's rather particular, sir. They are, especially when they're sacristans. It, it rushed over me, and I says to myself, Bolsheviks, and I thought I should have swooned it, but I didn't. Mr. Prohack had to make an effort in order to maintain his self-control, for the mumblings of this fat lady were producing in him the most singular and the most disturbing sensations. If there's any tea left in the pot, said he, I, I think I'll have it. "'And welcome, sir,' replied the fat lady. "'But there's only one cup, but, but I've had yet but hardly drunk out of it, sir.' Mr. Prohack first of all went to the door, transferred the key from the outside to the inside, and locked the door. Then he drank the dregs of the tea out of the sole cup, and seeing a packet of Mr. Brule's gold-flaked cigarettes on the mahogany sideboard, he ventured to help himself to one. "'Yes, sir,' resumed the flat lady. I nearly swooned it, and I couldn't feel happier no more until I'd made a clean breast of it all to Milcher. And, uh, and I was setting off for Milcher when it struck me all of a heap, as I promised the young lady with a turned-up nose, as I wouldn't say nothing about the keys to nobody. It was very awkward for me, sir, me being converted and anxious to do right, and 
not knowing which was right and which was wrong. But a promise is a promise whether you're converted or not. That I do hold. Anyhow, I says to myself, I must see Milcher, and I tell him the clock hasn't struck eleven. And I prayed as hard as I could for heavenly guidance, and I was just coming down the square on my way to Milcher's when who should I see get out of a taxi and run into this house but that young lady and her young man? I said in my haste that was an answer to prayer. But I'm not so sure now, sir, as I wasn't presuming too much. I could see there was something swanky going on here, and I said to myself, That young lady's gone in. She'll come out again. She's one of the guests, she is, I said. And him too. And I'll wait till she does come out, and then I'll catch her and have it out with her, even if it means policeman. And the area gate being unfastened, I slipped down the area steps, so with my eye on the front door. And that was what did me. I had to sit down on the stone steps, sir, because of my varicose veins, and then one of the servants came in from the street, sir, and I more like dropped down the area steps, sir, than walked, sir, and hid between two dustbins, and when the coast was clear I went up again and found gate locked and nothing doing, and it's as true as I'm standing here, sitting, I should say. Mr. Prohack paused, collecting himself, determined to keep his nerve through everything. Then he said, when did the mysterious young lady borrow the keys from you? Uh, last night, sir. I, I mean the night before last. And where are the keys now? Milcher's got em, sir. I, I lay he's up in the tower by this time, a worrying over that clock. It'll be in the papers. You see if it isn't, sir. And he's got no idea that you ever lent the keys? That he has not, sir. And the question is, must I tell him? What exactly are the relations between you and Mr. Milcher? Well, sir, he's, he's a bit dotty about me, as you might say, and he's, he's going to marry me, so he says, and, and I believe him. And Mr. Prohack reflected, impressed by the wonder of existence. This woman, too, has charm for somebody, who looks on her as the most appetizing morsel on earth. Now, he said aloud, you are good enough to ask my opinion whether you ought to tell Mr. Milcher. My advice to you is, don't. I applaud your conversion. But, as you say, a promise is a promise, even if it's a naughty promise. You did wrong to promise. You will suffer for that, and don't think your conversion will save you from suffering, because it won't. Don't run away with the idea that conversion is a patent medicine. It isn't. It's rather a queer thing, very handy in some ways, and very awkward in others. And you must use it with common sense, or you'll get both yourself and other people into trouble. As for the clock, its stopping striking is only a coincidence, obviously. Abandon the word Bolshevik. It's a very overworked word, and wants a long repose. If the clock had been stopped from striking by your young friends, it would have been stopped the evening before last, when they went up the tower. And don't imagine there's any snub-nosed young lady living here. There isn't. She must have left while you were down among the dustbins, Mrs. Milcher. That is to be. She paid you something for your trouble, quite possibly. If so, give the money to the poor. That'll be the best way to be converted. Uh, so I will, sir. Yes, and now you must go. He unlocked the door and opened it. Quick, quietly, into the area, and up the area steps, and... Uh, stop a moment. Don't you be seen in the square for at least a year. A big robbery was committed in this very house last night. You'll see it in today's papers. My butler connected your presence in the area, and quite justifiably connected it with the robbery. Without out knowing it, you've been in the most dreadful danger. I'm saving you. If you don't use your conversion with discretion, it may land you in prison. Take my advice, and be silent first, and converted afterwards. Good morning. Tut, tut. He stopped the outflow of the alarmed gratitude. Didn't I advise you to be silent? Creep, Mrs. Milcher, creep. End of chapter 20, part 1《"'I have talked to her very seriously. Let her go,' answered Mr. Prohack. Eve sat down as if stabbed on the chair in front of her dressing-table, and stared at Mr. Prohack. "'You've let her go?' 
cried she, with an outraged gasp, implying that she had always suspected that she was married to a nincompoop, but not to such a nincompoop. "'Where's she gone to?' Well, "'I don't know.' "'What's her name? Who is she?' "'I don't know that either. I only know that she's engaged to be married, and that a certain sacristan is madly, but I hope honourably, in love with her, and that she's had nothing whatever to do with the disappearance of your necklace.' "'I suppose she told you so herself,' said Eve, with an irony that might have shrivelled up a husband less philosophic. "'She did not. She didn't say a word about the necklace. But she did make a full confession. She's mixed up in the clock-striking business.' "'The what business?' "'The striking of the church clock. You know it stopped striking since last night, under the wise dispensation of heaven.' As he made this perfectly simple announcement, Mr. Browick observed a certain change in his wife's countenance. Her brow puckered. A sad, protesting, worried look came into her eyes. "'Please don't begin on the clock again, my poor Arthur. You ought to forget it. You know how bad it is for you to dwell on it. It gets on your nerves, and you start imagining all sorts of things, until, of course, there's no chance of you sleeping. If you keep on like this, you'll make me feel a perfect criminal for taking the house.' You don't suspect it, but I've several times wished we never had taken it. I've been so upset about your nervous conditions. I was merely saying, Mr. Brohack insisted, that our fat visitor, who apparently had enormous seductive power over sacristans, has noticed nothing about the clock, just as I had, and she thought— Eve interrupted him by approaching swiftly and putting her hands on his shoulders, as he had put his hands on her shoulders a little while earlier, and gazing with supplication at him. "'Please, please,' she besought him, "'to oblige me, do drop the church clock. "'I know what it means for you.' Mr. Bragg turned away, broke into uproarious and somewhat hysterical laughter, and left the bedroom, having perceived to his amazement that she thought the church clock was undermining his sanity. Going to his study, he rang the bell there, and Brule, with features pale and drawn, obeyed the summons. The fact that his sanity was suspect, however absurdly, somehow caused Mr. Prohack to assume a pontifical manner of unusual dignity. Uh, "'Is Miss Warburton up yet?' Uh, "'No, sir. One of the servants knocked at her door some little time ago, but received no answer. Uh, she must be awakened, and I'll write a note that she must be given to her immediately.' Mr. Prohack wrote, "'Please dress at once and come to my study. I want to see you about the church clock. A. Eh? Then he waited, alternately feeling the radiator and warming his legs at the newly lit wood fire. He was staggered by the incredible turn of events, and he had a sensation that nothing was or ever would be secure in the structure of his environment. "'When I'm hanged! When I'm hanged!' he kept saying to himself, and indeed several times asserted that an even more serious fate had befallen him. "'Here I am!' he exclaimed brazenly, entering the room. The statement was not exaggerated. She emphatically was there, aspiring nose, and all, in full evening dress, the costume of the night before. "'Have you slept in your clothes?' Mr. Prohack demanded. Her manner altered at his formidable tone. "'No, sir,' she replied meekly. "'But I have nothing else here. I shall put a cloak on and drive off in a taxi to change for the day. May I sit down?' Mr. Prohack nodded. Indutably he, she made a wonderful sight in her daring splendour. "'So you found out all about it already?' said she, still meekly, while Mr. Prohack was seeking the right gambit. "'Please do tell me how,' she added, disposing the folds of her short skirt about the chair. "'I'm not here to answer questions,' said Mr. Prohack. "'I'm here to ask them. How did you do it? Was it you or Charlie or both of you? Whose idea was it?' "'It was my idea,' Mimi purred. Mr. Charles seemed to like it. It was really very simple. We first of all found out about the sexton. And how did you do that? Private inquiry agents, of course. Same people who were in charge here last night. I knew of them when I was with Mr. Carroll Choir, and it was I who introduced them to Mrs. Prohack. It would be, Mr. Prohack commented. And then? And then, when we discovered Mrs. Slipston, or Miss Slipston, who's she? She's a rather stout charwoman who has a fascination for the sexton of St. Nicodemus. When I got her it was all plain sailing. 
She lent me the church keys, and Mr. Charles and I went up the tower to reconnoitre. But that was more than twenty-four hours before the clock ceased to strike, and you returned the keys to her. Oh, so you know that too, do you? said Mimi blandly. Mr. Poack, I hope you'll forgive me for saying that you're most frightfully clever. I did give the keys back to Mrs. Slipston a long time before the clock stopped striking. But, you see, Mr. Charles had taken impression of the tower key in clay, so that last night we were able to go up with an electric torch and our own key. And the clock is a very old one, and Mr. Charles removed a swivel or something, I forget what he called it, but he seemed to understand everything about every kind of machinery. He says it would take a tremendous long time to get another swivel, or whatever it is, cast, even if it could ever be cast without a pattern, and that you'll be safe for at least six months, even if we don't rely on the natural slowness of the established church to just do anything really active. You see, it isn't as if the clock was go wasn't going. It's showing the time all right, and that will be sufficient to keep the rector and the church wardens quiet. It keeps up appearances. Of course, if the clock had stopped entirely, they would have had to do something. You don't seem very pleased, dear Mr. Prohack. We, we thought you'd be delighted. We did it all for you. Did you indeed? said Mr. Prohack ruthlessly. And did you think of the riskiness of what you were doing? There'll be a most appalling scandal, certainly police court proceedings, and I shall be involved if it comes to light. But it can't come to light, Mimi exploded. And yet it came to my light. Yes, I expect Mr. Charles was so proud that he couldn't help telling you some bits about it. But nobody else can know. Even if Mrs. Slipston lets on to the sexton, the sexton will never let on, because if he did he'd lose his place. The sexton will always have to deny that he parted with the keys, even for a moment. It would be the loveliest mystery that ever was, and all the police in the world won't solve it. Of, of course, if, if you aren't pleased, I'm, I'm very sorry. It isn't a question of not being pleased. The breath is simply knocked out of me. That's what it is. Whatever possessed you to do it? But something had to be done, Mr. Prohack. Everybody in the house was terribly upset about you. You couldn't sleep because of the clock, and you said you never would sleep. Mrs. Prohack was at her wit's end. Everybody in the house was terribly upset about me. This is the first I've heard of anybody being terribly upset about me. I thought that everybody except me had forgotten all about the infernal clock. Naturally, said Mimi, with soothing calmness. Mrs. Prohack quite rightly forbade any mention of the clock in your presence. She said the best thing to do was to help you to forget it by never referring to it, and we all agreed with her. But it weighed on us dreadfully, and something really had to be done. Mr. Prohack was not unimpressed by this revelation of the existence of a social atmosphere which he had never suspected. But he was in no mood for compromise. "'Now just listen to me,' said he. "'You are, without exception, the most dangerous woman that I have ever met. All women are dangerous, but you are an acute peril.' "'Yes,' Mimi admitted. "'Mr. Carroll Quire used to talk like that. I got quite used to it.' "'Did he really? Well, I think all the better of him, then.' The mischief with you is that your motives are good. But a good motive is no excuse for a criminal act, and still less excuse for an idiotic act. I don't suppose I should do any good by warning you, yet I do hereby most solemnly warn you to mend your ways. And I wish you to understand clearly that I am not a bit grateful to you. In fact, the reverse. Mimi stiffened herself. Perhaps you would prefer us to restore the missing part and start the clock striking again. It would be perfectly easy. We still have our own key to the tower, and we could do it to-night. I'm sure it will be at least a week before the church warden sent an expert clockmaker up the tower. In that moment, Mr. Brohacker had a distressing glimpse into the illogical peculiarities of the human conscience, especially his own. He knew that he ought to accept Mimi's offer, since it would definitely obviate the possible consequences of her criminal act and close a discreditable incident. But he thought of his bad nights instead of thinking of Mimi's morals and the higher welfare of society. No, he said, let sleeping clocks lie. And he saw that Mimi read the meanness of his soul and was silently greeting him as a fellow sinner. She surprised him by saying, I assure you, Mr. Prohack, that my sole idea, that our sole idea, was to make the house more possible for you. 
and as she uttered these words she gazed at him with a sort of delicious pouting, challenging reproach. What a singular remark, he thought. It implied a comprehension of the fact, which he had considerately never disclosed, that he objected to the house in Toto, and would have been happier in his former abode. And curiously it implied further that she comprehended and sympathised with his objections. She knew she had not done everything necessary to reconcile him to the noble mansion, but she had done what she could, and it was not negligible. "'Nothing of the kind,' said he. "'You simply had no sole idea. "'When I admitted just now that your motives were good, I was exaggerating. "'Your motives were only half good. "'And if you think otherwise, you are deceiving yourself. "'You are not being realistic. "'In that respect you are no better than anybody else.' "'What was my other motive, then?' she inquired submissively, "'as if appealing for information to the greatest living authority "'on the enigmas of her own heart.' Well, your other motive was to satisfy your damnable instinct for dubious and picturesque adventure, said Mr. Prohack. You were pandering to the evil in you. If you could have stopped the clock from striking by walking down Bond Street in Mrs. Slipson's clothes, and especially her boots, would you have done it? Certainly not. Of course you wouldn't. Don't try to come the self-sacrificing saint over me, because you can't do it. These words, even of amounting to a just estimate of the situation, were ruthless and terrible. They might have accomplished some genuine and lasting good, if Mr. Prohack had spoken them in a tone corresponding to the import. But he did not. His damnable instinct for pleasing people once more got the better of him, and he spoke them in a benevolent and paternal tone, his voice vibrating with compassion and with appreciation of her damnable instinct for dubious and picturesque adventure. A tone destroyed the significance of the words. Moreover, not content with the falsifying tone, he rose up from his chair as he spoke, approached the charming and naughty girl, and patted her on the shoulder. The rebuke indeed ended by being more agreeable to the sinner than praise might have been from a man less corroded with duplicity than Mr. Prohack. Mimi surprised him a second time. "'You're perfectly right,' she said. "'You always are.' and she seized his limp hand in hers, and kissed it, and ran away, leaving him looking at the kissed hand. Well, he was flattered, and he was pleased, or at any rate something in him, some fragmentary part of him, was flattered and pleased. Mimi's gesture was a triumph for a man nearing fifty, but it was an alarming triumph. Odd that in that moment he should think of Lady Massulum. His fatal charm was as a razor, had he been playing with it as a baby might play with a razor? Popinjay? Coxcomb? Perhaps. Nevertheless, the wench had artistically kissed his hand, and his hand felt self-complacent, even if he didn't. Brule, toward whom Mr. Prohack felt no impulse of goodwill, came largely in with a salver on which were the morning letters and the morning papers, including the paper perused by Machin with her early bedside tea, and doubtless carefully folded again in its original creases to look virginal. The reappearance of that sheet had somewhat the quality of a sinister miracle to Mr. Prohack. He asked no questions about it, so that he might be told no lies, but he searched it in vain for a trace of the suffering Machin. It was, however, full of typographical traces of himself and his family. The description of the reception was disturbingly journalistic, which adjective for Mr. Prohack unfortunately connoted the adjective vulgar. All the wrong people were in the list of guests, and all the decent, quiet people were omitted. A value of twenty thousand pounds was put upon the necklace, contradicting another part of the report which stated the pearls to be priceless. Mr. Prohack's fortune was referred to, also his treasury past, the implication being that the fortune had caused him to leave the treasury. His daughter's engagement to Mr. Morphy was glanced at, and it was remarked that Mr. Morphy, known to all his friends and half-London as Ozzy Morphy, was intimately connected with the greatest stage Napoleon in history, Mr. Asprey Chown. Finally, a few words were given to Charlie, who was dubbed, a budding financier already responsible for one highly successful coup, and likely to be responsible for several others before much more water has run under the bridges of the Thames. Mr. Prohack knew then, in his limbs, the meaning of the word writhe, 
and he was glad that he had not had his bath, because even if he had had his bath he would have needed another one. His attitude towards his fellow men had a touch of embittered and cynical scorn, unworthy of a philosopher. He turned, in another paper, to the financial column, for, though all his money was safe in fixed interest-bearing securities, the fluctuations of whose capital value could not affect his safety, yet he somehow could not remain quite indifferent to the fluctuations of their capital value. And in the financial column he saw a reference to a young operator, who he was convinced could be no other than Charlie. In the reference there was a note of sarcasm which hurt Mr. Prohack and aroused anew his apprehension and, among his correspondence, was a letter which had been delivered by hand. He thought he knew the handwriting on the envelope, and he did. It was from Mr. Softly Bishop. Mr. Softly Bishop begged, in a very familiar style, that Mr. Prohack and wife would join himself and Miss Fancy on an early day at a little luncheon party, and he announced that, the highly desirable event to the possibility of which he had alluded, on the previous evening, had duly occurred. Strange! the fellow's eagerness to publish his engagement to a person of more notoriety than distinction. The fellow must have popped the question while escorting Miss Fancy home in the middle of the night, and he must have written the note before breakfast and dispatched it by special messenger. What a mentality! Mr. Brohack desired now a whole series of baths, and he was very harassed indeed. If he, by a fluke, had discovered the escapade of the church tower and the church clock, why should not others discover it by other flukes? Was it conceivable that such a matter should forever remain a secret? The thing, to Mr. Brohack's sick imagination, was like a bomb with a fuse attached and the fuse lighted. When the bomb did go off, what trouble for an entirely innocent Mr. Prohack! And he loathed the notion of his proud, strong daughter being affianced to a man who, however excellent intrinsically, was the myrmidon of that sublime showman, Mr. Asprey Chan. And he hated his connection with Mr. Softly Bishop, and with Miss Fancy. Could he refuse the invitation to the little luncheon party? He knew that he could not refuse it. His connection with these persons was indisputable, and the social consequences of it could not be fairly avoided. As for the matter of the necklace, he held that he could deal with that. But could he? He lacked confidence in himself. Even his fixed interest-bearing securities might, by some inconceivable world catastrophe, cease to bear interest. And then where would he be? Philosophy. Philosophy was absurdly unpractical. Philosophy could not cope with real situations. Where had he sinned? Nowhere. He had taken Dr. Vega's advice and given up trying to fit his environment to himself instead of vice versa. He let things rip, and shown no egotistic concern in the business of others. But was he any better off in his secret self? Not a whit. He ought to have been happy. He was miserable. On every hand the horizon was dark, and the glitter of seventeen thousand pounds per annum did not lighten it by the illuminative power of a single candle. But his feverish hand gratefully remembered Mimi's kiss. 6. Nevertheless, as the day waxed and began to wane, it was obvious even to Mr. Prohack that the domestic climate grew sunnier and more bracing. A weight seemed to be lifted from the hearts of all Mr. Prohack's entourage. The theft of the twenty thousand pound necklace was a grave event, but it could not impair the beauty of the great fact that the church clock had ceased to strike, and that therefore the master would be able to sleep. The shadow of a menacing calamity had passed, and everybody's spirits, except Mr. Prohax, reacted to the news. Machin, restored to duty, was gaiety itself. But Mr. Prohack, unresponsive, kept on absurdly questioning his soul and the universe. What am I getting out of life? Can it be true that I am incapable of arranging my existence in such a manner that the worm shall not feed so gluttonously on my damask cheek? Eve's attitude to him altered. In view of the persistent silence of the clock, she had to admit to herself that her husband was still a long way off in sanity, 
and she was ashamed of her suspicion, and did all that she could to make compensation to him, while imitating his discreet example, and not referring even distantly to the clock. When she mentioned the necklace, suggesting a direct appeal to Scotland Yard, and he discountenanced the scheme, she at once, in the most charming way, accepted his verdict and praised his superior wisdom. When he placed before her the invitation for Mr. Softly Bishop, she beautifully offered to disentangle him from it, if he should so desire. When she told him that she had been asked to preside over the Social Amenities Committee of the League of All the Arts, and he advised her not to bind herself by taking any official position, and especially one which would force her into contact with a pack of self-seeking snobbish women, she beamed acquiescence, and heartily concurred with him about the pack of women. In fact, the afternoon became one of those afternoons on which every caprice was permitted to Mr. Prohack, and he could do no wrong. But the worm still fed on his cheek. Before tea he enjoyed a sleep, without having to time his repose so as to avoid being wakened by the clock. And then tea for one was served with full pomp in his study. This meant either that his tireless women were out, all that Eve had judged it prudent to indulge him in a solitary tea. And, after the hurried, thick-cupped teas at the treasury, he certainly did not dislike a leisurely tea replete with every luxury proper to the repast. He yet drank and read odd things in odd corners of the times, and at last he smoked. He was on the edge of felicity in his miserableness when his indefatigable women entered, all smiles. They had indeed been out, and they were still arrayed for the street. One by one they removed, or cast aside, such things as gloves, hats, coats, bags, until the study began to bear some resemblance to a boudoir. Mr. Prohack, though cheerfully grumbling at this, really liked it, for he was of those who think that nothing furnishes a room so well as a woman's hat, provided it be not permanently established. Sissy even took off one shoe, on the plea that it hurt her, and there the trifling article lay, fragile, gleaming, and absurd. Mr. Brohack appreciated it even more than the hats. He understood, perhaps better than ever before, that though he had a vast passion for his wife, there was enough emotion left in him to nourish an affection almost equally vast for his daughter. She was a proud piece, was that girl, and he was intensely proud of her nor did a realistic estimate of her faults of character seem in the least to diminish his pride in her. She had distinction. She had race. Mimi might possibly be able to make rings round her in the pursuit of any practical enterprise, but her mere manner of existing from moment to moment was superior to Mimi's. The simple-minded parent was indeed convinced at heart that the world held no finer young woman than Sissy Prohack. He reflected with satisfaction. She knows I'm old, but there's something young in me that forces her to treat me as young, and moreover she adores me. He also reflected, Of course, they're after something, these two. I can see a put-up job in their eyes. Ha! He was ready for them, and the sensation of being ready for them was like a tonic to him, raising him momentarily above misery. You look much better, Arthur, said Eve, artfully preparing. I am, said he. I've had a bath. "'Had you given up baths, Dad?' asked Sissy, with a curl of the lips. "'No, but I mean I've had two baths, one in water, and the other in resignation.' "'How dull!' "'I've been thinking about the arrangements for the wedding,' Eve started, in a new, falsely careless tone, ignoring the badinage between her husband and daughter, which she always privately regarded as tedious. There it was. They had come to worry him about the wedding. He had not recovered from one social martyrdom before they were plotting to push him into another. They were implacable, insatiable, were his women. He got up and walked about. "'Now, Dad,' said he addressed him, "'don't pretend you aren't interested.' And then she burst into the most extraordinary laughter, laughter that bordered on the hysterical, and twirled herself round on the shod foot. Her behaviour offended Eve. "'Of course, if you're going on like that, Sissy, I warn you I shall give it all up. After all, it won't be my wedding.' Sissy clasped her mother's neck. "'Don't be foolish, you silly old mater. It's a wedding, not a funeral.' "'Well, what about it?' 
asked Mr. Brehack, sniffing with pleasure the new atmosphere created in his magnificent study by these feminine contacts. "'Do you think we'd better have the wedding at St. George's Hanover Square, or at St. Nicodemus's?' The name of Nicodemus, Mr. Prahack started, as it were, guiltily. "'Because,' Eve continued, "'we can have it at either place. You see, Ozzie lives in one parish, and Sissy in the other. St. Nicodemus has been getting rather fashionable lately, I'm told.' "'What saith the bride?' "'Oh, don't ask me,' answered Sissy lightly. "'I'm prepared for anything.' mother's affair, not mine, in spite of what she says, and nobody shall be able to say after I'm married that I wasn't a dutiful daughter. I should love St. George's, and I should love St. Nicodemus's too. And then she exploded again into disconcerting laughter, and the fit lasted longer than the first one. Eve protested again, and Sissy made peace again. St. Nicodemus would be more original, said Eve. Not so original as you said Mr. Prohack. Sissy choked on a lace handkerchief. St. Nicodemus was selected for the august rite. Similar phenomena occurred when Eve introduced the point whether the reception should be at Manchester Square or at Claridge's Hotel. And when Eve suggested that it might be well to enliven the mournfulness of a wedding with an orchestra and dancing, Sissy leaped up and, seizing her father's hand, whizzed him dangerously round the room to a tune of her own singing. The girl's mere physical force amazed him. The dance was brought to a conclusion by the overturning of an occasional table and a Tanagra figure, whereupon Sissy laughed more loudly and hysterically than ever. Mr. Brohack deemed that masculine tact should be applied. He soothed the outraged mother and tranquillized the ecstatic daughter, and then in a matter-of-fact voice asked, "'And what about the dates?' Do let's get it over. We must consult Ozzy, said the pacified mamma. Off went Sissy again into shrieks. If you mean, she spluttered, it's not Ozzy's wedding, it's mine. You fix your own date, dearest, and leave Ozzy to me. Ozzy's only function at my wedding is to be indispensable. And still laughing in the most crude and shocking way, she ran on her uneven feet out of the room, leaving the shoe behind on the hearth rug to prove that she really existed, and was not a hallucination. "'I can't make out what's the matter with that girl,' said Eve. "'The sooner she's married, the better,' said Mr. Brohack, thoroughly reconciled now to the tedium of the ceremonies. "'I dare say you're right, but upon my word I don't know what girls are coming to.' "'Nobody ever did know that,' said Mr. Brohack easily, though he also was far from easy in his mind about the bridal symptoms. 7. Can uh, Charlie speak to you for a minute? The voice was Eve's, diplomatic, apologetic. Her smiling and yet serious face peeping in through the bedroom door seemed to say, I know we're asking a great favour and that your life is hard. All right, said Mr. Prohack, as a gracious, long-suffering autocrat, without moving his eyes from the book he was reading. He had gone to bed. He had of late got into the habit of going to bed. He would go to bed on the slightest excuse, and would justify himself by pointing out that Voltaire used to do the same. He was capable of going to bed several times a day. It was early evening. The bed, though hired for a year only, was of extreme comfortableness. The light over his head was in exactly the right place. The room was warm. The book, by a Roman emperor properly known as or Marcus Aurelius, counted among the world's masterpieces. It was designed to suit the case of Mr. Prohack, for its message was to the effect that happiness and content are commodities which can be manufactured only in the mind, from the mind's own ingredients, and that if the mind works properly, no external phenomena can prevent the manufacture of the said commodities. In short, everything was calculated to secure Mr. Prohack's felicity in that moment. But he would not have it. He said to himself, this book is all very fine, immortal, and supreme, and so on. And it simply isn't true. Human nature won't work the way this book says it ought to work, and what's more, the author was obviously afraid of life. He was never really alive, and he was never happy. Finally, the tendency of the book is mischievously antisocial. Thus did Mr. Prohack seek to destroy a reputation of many centuries 
and to deny opinions which he himself had been expressing for many years. "'I don't want to live wholly in myself,' said Mr. Prohack. "'I want to live a great deal in other people. "'If you do that, you may be infernally miserable, but at least you aren't dull. "'Marcos Aurelius was more like a potato than I should care to be.' and he shoved the book under the pillow, turned half over from his side to the flat of his back, and prepared with gusto for the evil which Charlie would surely bring. And indeed one glance at Charlie's preoccupied features confirmed his provision. "'You're in trouble, my lad,' said he. "'I am,' said Charlie. "'And the hour has struck when you want your effete father's help,' Mr. Prohack smiled benevolently. "'Put it like that.' said Charlie, amiably, taking a chair and smoothing out his trousers. "'I suppose you've seen the references to yourself in the papers?' "'Yes.' "'Rather sarcastic, aren't they?' "'Yes, but that rather flatters me, you know, Dad. Shows I'm being taken notice of.' "'Till you have been playing a dangerous game, haven't you?' "'Admitted,' said Charlie, brightly and modestly. "'But I was reading in one of my new books that it is not a bad scheme to live dangerously.' And I quite agree. Anyhow, it suits me, and it's quite on the cards that I may pull through. You mean, if I help you? Now listen to me, Charlie. I'm your father, and if you're on earth, it's my fault, and everything that happens to you is my fault. Hence I'm ready to help you as far as I can, which is a long way, but I'm not ready to throw my money into a pit unless you can prove to my hard treasury mind that the pit is not too deep and has a firm, unbreakable bottom. Rather than have anything to do with a pit that has all attractive qualities except a bottom, I would prefer to see you in the bankruptcy court and make you an allowance for life. That's absolutely sound, Charlie concurred with beautiful acquiescence. It's awfully decent of you to talk like this. I expect I could soon prove to you that my pit is the sort of pit you wouldn't mind throwing things into, and possibly one day I might ask you to do some throwing. But I'm getting along pretty well so far as money is concerned. I I've come to ask you for something else. Oh! Mr. Prohack was a little dashed. But Charlie's demeanour was so ingratiating that he did not feel in the least hurt. Yes, there's been some trouble between Mimi and me this afternoon, and I'm hoping that you'll straighten it out for me. Ah! Mr. Prohack's interest became suddenly intense and pleasurable. The silly girl's given me notice. She's fearfully hurt because you told her that I told you about the church clock affair, after it had been agreed between her and me that we wouldn't let on to anybody at all. She says she can't possibly stay with anybody who isn't loyal, and that I'm not the man she thought I was, and she's given notice. And I can't do without that girl. I knew she'd be perfectly invaluable to me, and she is. Mr. Prohack was staggered at this revelation concerning Mimi. It seemed to make her heroic and even more incalculable. Well, I never told her you'd told me anything about the clock-striking business, he exclaimed. I felt sure you hadn't, said Charlie blandly. I wonder how she got the idea into her head. Now I come to think of it, said Mr. Prohack, she did assume this morning that you must have told me about the clock, and I didn't contradict her. Why should I? Oh, just so, Charlie smiled faintly. "'But I'd be awfully obliged if you contradict her now. "'One word from you will put it all right.' "'I'll ask her to come and see me first thing in the morning,' said Mr. Prohack. "'But would you believe it, my lad, that she never gave me the slightest sign this morning "'that your telling me anything about the clock would upset her? "'Not the slightest sign.' "'No, she wouldn't,' said Charlie. "'She's like that. "'She's the strangest mixture of reserve and rashness you ever saw.' "'No, she isn't.' "'because they're all the strangest mixture, "'except, of course, your esteemed mother, "'whom we all agree is perfect. "'Anything else I can do for you to-night?' "'You might tell me how you did find out "'about the church clock. "'With pleasure. "'The explanation will surprise you. "'I found out because, in my old-world way, "'I'm jolly clever. "'And that's all there is to it. "'Good night, Ned. "'Thanks very much.' "'After Charlie had gone, "'Mr. Brohack said to himself, that boy's getting on. I can remember the time when he would have come snorting in here, full of his grievance, and been very sarcastic when I offered him money he didn't want. What a change! Oh, yes, he's getting on all right. He'll come through. 
and Mr. Brohack was suddenly much fonder of the boy, and more inclined to see in him the possibility of genius. But he was aware of apprehension as to the relations forming between his son and Mimi. That girl appeared to be establishing an empire over the great youthful prodigy of finance. Was this desirable? No, that was not the question. The question was, would Eve regard it as desirable? He could never explain to his wife how deeply he had been touched by Mimi's mad solicitude for the slumber of Charlie's father. And even if he could have explained, Eve would never have consented to understand. End of chapter 20, part 2《Part One of Chapter Twenty One of Mr. Prohack by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part One of Chapter Twenty One Eve's Martyrdom. One. After a magnificent night's sleep, so magnificent indeed that he felt as if he had never until that moment really grasped the full significance of the word sleep, Mr. Prohack rang the bell for his morning tea. Of late he had given orders that he must not under any circumstances be called, for it had been vouchsafed to him that in spite of a multitude of trained servants there were still things that he could do for himself better than anybody else could do for him, and among them was the act of waking up Mr. Prohack. He knew that he was in a very good humour, capable of miracles, and he therefore determined that he would seize the opportunity to find the human side of Mr. Brule and make a friend of him. But the tea-tray was brought in by Mrs. Prohack, who was completely and severely dressed. She put down the tray and kissed her husband, not as usual, but rather in the manner of a Roman matron, and Mr. Prohack divined that something had happened. "'I hope Brule hasn't dropped down dead,' said he, realising the foolishness of his facetiousness as he spoke. Eve seemed to be pained. "'Have you slept better?' she asked the solicitors. "'I have slept so well that there's probably something wrong with me,' said he. "'Heavy sleep is a symptom of several dangerous diseases.' "'I'm glad you've had a good night,' she began, again ignoring his maladroit flippancy. "'Cause I wanted to talk to you.' "'Darling,' he responded, "'pour out my tea for me, will you? "'Then I shall be equal to any strain. "'I trust that you also passed a fair night, madam. "'You look tremendously fit.' visions of Lady Massillon flitted through his mind, but he decided that Eve, seriously pouring out tea for him under the lamp in the morning twilight of the pale bedroom, could not be matched by either Lady Massillon or anybody else. No, he could not conceive a Lady Massillon pouring out early tea. The Lady Massillons could only pour out afternoon tea, a job easier to do with grace and satisfaction. "'I have not slept a wink all night,' said Eve primly. "'but I was determined that nothing should induce me to disturb you.' "'Yes?' Mr. Prohack encouraged her, sipping the first glorious sip. "'Well, would you believe me that Sissy slipped out last night after dinner "'without saying a word to me or anyone, "'and that she didn't come back, and hasn't come back? "'I sat up for her till three o'clock. "'I telephoned to Charlie, but no, he'd seen nothing of her.' "'Did you telephone to Ozzie?' Telephone to Ozzy, my poor boy, of course I didn't. I wouldn't have Ozzy know for anything. Besides, he isn't on the telephone at his flat. That's a good reason for not telephoning, anyway, said Mr. Prohack. But did you ever hear of such a thing? The truth is, you've spoilt that child. I may have spoilt the child, Mr. Prohack admitted. But I have heard of such a thing. I seem to remember that in the dear dead days of dancing studios, something similar occurred to your daughter. "'Yes, but we didn't know where she was.' "'You didn't. I did,' Mr. Prohack corrected her. "'Do you want me to cry?' Eve demanded suddenly. "'Yes,' said Mr. Prohack. "'I love to see you cry.' Eve pursed her lips and wrinkled her brows and gazed at the window, performing great feats of self-control under extreme provocation to lose her temper. "'What do you propose to do?' he asked with formality. "'Wait till the girl comes back.' Said Mr. Prohack. Arthur, I really cannot understand how you can take a thing like this so casually. No, I really can't. Neither can I, Mr. Prohack admitted quite truthfully. 
He saw that he ought to have been gravely upset by Sissy's prank, and he was merely amused. The effect of too much sleep, no doubt, he added. Eve walked about the room. I pretended to Machin this morning that Sissy had told me that she was sleeping out, and that I have forgotten to tell Machin. It's a good thing we haven't engaged ladies' maids yet. I can trust Machin. I know she didn't believe me this morning, but I can trust her. You see, after Sissy's strange behaviour these last few days, now one doesn't know what to think. And there's something else. Every morning for the last three or four weeks, Sissy's gone out somewhere, for an hour or two, quite regularly. And where she went, I've never been able to find out. Of course, with a girl like her, it doesn't do to ask too direct questions. Ah, I should like to have seen my mother in my place. I know what she'd have done. What would your mother have done? She always seems to me to be a fairly harmless creature. Yes, to you. Do you think we ought to inform the police? No. I'm so glad. The necklace and Sissy coming on top of each other? No, it would be too much. Never rains, but it pours, does it? observed Mr. Prefax. But what are we to do? Just what your mother would have done. Your mother would have argued like this. Either Sissy is staying away against her will, or she is staying away of her own accord. If the former, it means an accident, and we are bound to hear shortly from one of the hospitals. If the latter, we can only sit tight. Your mother had a vigorous mind, and that is how she would have looked at things. I never know how to take you, Arthur, said Mrs. Prohack, and went on. And what makes it all the more incomprehensible is that yesterday afternoon Sissy went with me to Jay's to see about the wedding dress. But why should that make it all the more incomprehensible? Don't you think it does, somehow? I do. Did she giggle at Jay's? Oh, no, oh, except once. Yes, I think she giggled once. That was when the fitter said she hoped we would give them plenty of time, because most customers rushed them so. I remember thinking how queer it was that Sissy should laugh so much at a perfectly simple remark like that. Oh, Arthur! Now, my child, said Mr. Prohack firmly, don't get into your head that Sissy has gone off hers. Yesterday you thought for quite half an hour that I was suffering from incipient lunacy. Let that suffice you for the present. Be philosophical. The source of tranquillity is within. Remember that, and remind me of it, too, because I am apt to forget it. We can do nothing at the moment. I will now get up, and I warn you that I shall want a large breakfast, and you to pour out my coffee and read the interesting bits out of the daily picture to me. 2. At eleven o'clock of the morning, the status quo was still maintaining itself within the noble mansion at Manchester Square. Mr. Brahack, washed, dressed, and amply fed, was pretending to be very busy with correspondence in his study, but he was in fact much more busy with Eve than with the correspondence. She came in to him every few minutes, and each time needed more delicate handling. After one visit, Mr. Brahack had an idea. He transferred the key from the inside to the outside of the door. The next visit Eve presented an ultimatum. She said that Mr. Prohack must positively do something about his daughter. Mr. Prohack replied that he would telephone to his solicitors, a project which happily commended itself to Eve, though what his solicitors could do except charge a fee, Mr. Prohack could not imagine. "'You wait here,' he said persuasively. He then left the room and silently locked the door on Eve. It was a monstrous act, but Mr. Prohack had slept too well and was too fully inspired by the instinct of initiative. He hurried downstairs, ignoring Brule, who was contemplating the grandeur of the entrance hall, snatched his overcoat, hat, and umbrella from the seventeenth-century panelled cupboard in which these articles were kept, and slipped away into the square, before Brule could even open the door for him. As he fled, he glanced up at the windows of his study, fearful lest Eve might have divined his purpose to abandon her, and, catching sight of him in flight, might begin making noises on the locked door. But Eve had not divined his purpose. Mr. Brohack walked straight to Bruton Street, where Oswald Morphy's Japanese flat was situated. Mr. Brohack had never seen this flat, though his wife and daughter had been invited to it for tea, and had returned therefrom with excited accounts of its exquisite uniqueness. He had decided that his duty was to inform Ozzy of the mysterious disappearance of Sissy as quickly as possible, and, as Ozzy's theatrical day was not supposed to begin until noon, he hoped to catch him before his departure to the beck and call of the mighty Asbury Chow. 
The number in Bruton Street indicated a tall, thin house with four bell pushes and four narrow brass plates on its door jamb. The deceitful edifice looked at a distance just like its neighbours, but, as the array on the door jamb showed, it had ceased to be what it seemed, the home of a respectable Victorian family in easy circumstances, and had become a Georgian warren for people who could reconcile themselves to a common staircase, provided only they might engrave a sound West End address on their notepaper. The front door was open, disclosing the reassuring fact that the hall and staircase were at any rate carpeted. Mr. Prohack rang the bell attached to Ozzy's name, waited, rang again, waited, and then marched upstairs. Perhaps Ozzy was shaving. Not being accustomed to the organisation of tenements in fashionable quarters, Mr. Prohack was unaware that, during certain hours of the day, he was entitled to ring the housekeeper's bell on the opposite door jam, and to summon help from the basement. As he mounted it, the staircase grew stuffier and stuffier, but the condition of the stair-carpet improved. Mr. Prerichak hated the place, and at once determined to fight powerfully against Sissy's declared intention of starting married life in her husband's bachelor flat for the sake of economy. He would force the pair, if necessary, to accept from him a flat rent-free, or he would even purchase for them one of those bijou residences of which he had heard tell. He little dreamed that this very house had once been described as a bijou residence. The third-floor landing was terribly small and dark, and Mr. Prohack could scarcely decipher the name of his future son-in-law on the shabby nameplate. Miss Den would be dear at eleven pence three farthings a year, said he to himself, and was annoyed because for months he had been picturing the elegant Oswald as the inhabitant of something orientally and impeccably luxurious, and he wondered that his women, as a rule so critical, had breathed no word of the flat's deplorable reproaches. He rang the bell, and the bell made a violent and horrid sound, which could scarcely fail to be heard throughout the remainder of the house. No answer. Ozzy had gone. He descended the stairs, and on the second-floor landing saw an old lady putting down a mat in front of an open door. The old lady's hair was in curl-papers. "'I suppose,' he ventured, raising his hat, "'I suppose you don't happen to know whether Mr. Morphy has gone out?' The old lady scanned him before replying. "'He can't be gone out,' she replied. "'He's just been sweeping his floor enough to wake the dead.' "'Sweeping his floor?' exclaimed Mr. Prohack, shocked and thunderstruck. "'I understood there were service flats.' "'So they are, in a way. But the housekeeper never gets up to this floor before half-past twelve, so it can't be the housekeeper. Besides, she's gone out for me.' "'Thank you,' said Mr. Prohack, and remounted the staircase. His blood was up. He would know the worst about the elegant Oswald, even if he had to beat the door down. He was, however, saved from this extreme measure, for when he aimlessly pushed against Oswald's door, it opened. He beheld a narrow passage, which in the matter of its decoration certainly did present a Japanese aspect to Mr. Prohack, who, however, had never been to Japan. Two doors gave off the obscure corridor, one of these doors was open, and in the doorway could be seen the latter half of a woman and the forward half of a carpet-brush. She was evidently brushing the carpet of a room, and gradually coming out of the room and into the passage. She wore a large blue pinafore apron, and she was so absorbed in her business that the advent of Mr. Prohack passed quite unnoticed by her. Mr. Prohack waited. More of the woman appeared, and at last the whole of her. She felt, rather than saw, the presence of a man at the entrance, and she looked up, transfixed. A deep blush travelled over all her features. "'How clever of you!' she said, with a fairly successful effort to be calm. "'Good morning, my child,' said Mr. Prohack, with a similar and equally successful effort. "'So you're cleaning Mr. Morphy's flat for him?' "'Yes, and not before it needed it. Do come in and shut the door.' Mr. Prohack obeyed, and Sissy shed her pinafore apron. Now we're quite private. I think you'd better kiss me. I may as well tell you that I'm fearfully happy, much more so than I expected to be at first. Mr. Brohack again obeyed, and when he kissed his daughter he had an almost entirely new sensation. The girl was far more interesting to him than she had ever been. Her blush thrilled him. You might care to glance at that, said Sissy, with an affectation of carelessness, 
indicating a longish, narrowish piece of paper covered with characters in red and black, which had been affixed to the wall of the passage with two pins. We put it there, at least I did, to save trouble. Mr. Prohack scanned the document. It began, This is to certify, and it was signed by a Registrar of Births, Deaths and Marriages. Yesterday, eh? he ejaculated. Yes, yesterday at two o'clock, not at St. George's and not at St. Nicodemus's. Well, you can say what you like, Dad. I'm not aware of having said anything yet, Mr. Prohack put in. You can say what you like, but what did you expect me to do? It was necessary to bring home to some people that this is the twentieth century, not the nineteenth, and I think I've done it. Anyway, what are you going to do about it? Do you seriously propose that I, I was going through all the orange blossom rigmarole, voice the breather, Eden, full coral, red carpet on the pavement, flowers, photographers, vicar, vestry, daily picture, reception, congratulations, rice, old shoes, gay away dress, be kind to her, Aussie? Not much. And I don't think. They say that girls love it and insist on it. Well, I don't, and I know some others who don't, too. I think it's simply barbaric, worse than a public funeral. Why, to my mind, it's Central African, and that's all there is to it, so there. She laughed. Well, said Mr. Prohack, holding his hat in his hand, I'm a tolerably two-faced person myself, but for sheer heartless duplicity I give you the palm. You can beat me. Has it occurred to you that this dodge of yours will cost you about fifty per cent of the wedding presents you might otherwise have had? It has, said Sissy. That was one reason why we tried the dodge. Nothing is more horrible than about fifty per cent of the wedding presents that brides get in these days. And we've had the two finest presents anybody could wish for. Oh? Yes. Ossie gave me Ossie, and I gave him me. I suppose the idea was yours. Of course. Didn't I tell you yesterday that Ozzy's only function at my wedding was to be indispensable? He was very much afraid at first when I started on the scheme, but he soon warmed to it. I'll give him credit for seeing that secrecy was the only thing. If we'd announced it beforehand, we should have been bound to be beaten. You see that yourself, don't you, dearest? And after all, it's our affair, and nobody else's. That's just where you're wrong, said Mr. Prohack grandly. A marriage, even yours, is an affair of the States. It concerns society. It is full of reactions on society. And society has been very wise to invest it with solemnity, and a certain grotesque quality. All solemnities are a bit grotesque, and so they ought to be. All solemnities ought to produce self-consciousness in the performers. As things are, you'll be ten years in convincing yourself that you're really a married woman, and, till the day of your death, and afterwards, society will have an instinctive feeling that there's something fishy about you or about Aussie. And it's your own fault. Oh, Dad, what a fraud you are! And the girl smiled. You know perfectly well that if you'd been in my place, and had had the pluck, which you wouldn't have had, you'd have done the same. I should, Mr. Prohack immediately admitted, because I always wanted to be smarter than other people. It's a cheap ambition. But I should have been wrong. And I'm exceedingly angry with you, and I shall be suffering from a sense of outrage and I should not be at all surprised if all is over between us. The thing amounts to a scandal. The worst of it is that no satisfactory explanation of it can ever be given to the world. If your Aussie is up, produce him, and I'll talk to him as he's never been talked to before. He's the elder, he's a man, and he's the most to blame. Take your overcoat off, said Sissy, laughing and kissing him again. And don't you dare to say a word to Aussie. Besides, he isn't in. He's gone off to business. He always goes at eleven-thirty punctually. There was a pause. Well, said Mr. Prohack, all I wish to state is that if you had a feather handy, you could knock me down with it. I can see all over your face, Sissy retorted, that you're so pleased and relieved you don't know what to do with yourself. Mr. Prohack perfunctorily denied this, but it was true. His relief that the wedding lay behind instead of in front of him was immense and his spirits rose even higher than they had been when he first woke up. He loathed all ceremonies, and the prospect of having to escort an orange-blossom-laden young woman in an automobile to a fashionable church, and up the aisle thereof, and raise his voice therein, and make a present of her to someone else, and breathe sugary nothings to a thousand gapers at a starchy reception, this prospect had increasingly become a nightmare to him. Often had he dwelt on it in a condition resembling panic, 
and now he felt genuinely grateful to his inexcusable daughter for her shameless effrontery. He desired greatly to do something very handsome indeed for her and her excellent tame husband. "'Step in and see my home,' she said. The home consisted of two rooms, one of them a bedroom and the other a sitting-room, together with a small bathroom that was as dark and dank as a cell of the Spanish Inquisition, and another apartment which he took for a cupboard, but which Sissy authoritatively conformed him, was a kitchen. The two principal rooms were beyond question beautifully Japanese in the matter of pictures, prints, and cabinets, not otherwise. They showed much taste. They were unusual and stimulating and jolly and refined. Mr. Brahack did not fancy that he personally could have lived in them with any striking success. The lack of space, of light, and of air, outweighed all considerations of charm and originality. The upper staircase alone would have ruined any flat for Mr. Brohack. "'Isn't it lovely?' Cissy encouraged him. "'Yes, it is,' he said feebly. "'Got any servants yet?' "'Oh, we can't have servants. No room for them to sleep, and I couldn't stand charwomen.' You see, it's a service flat, so there's really nothing to do. So I noticed when I came in, said Mr. Prohack, and I suppose you intend to eat at restaurants, or do they send up meals from the cellar? Oh, we shan't go to restaurants, Sissy replied. You may be sure of that. Too expensive for us. And I don't count much on the cookery downstairs. No, I should do the cooking in a chafing dish. Here it is, you see. I've been taking lessons in chafing-dish cookery every day for weeks, and it's awfully amusing. It is, really. It's much better than ordinary cooking, and cheaper, too. Ozzy loves it. Mr. Brohack was touched, and more than ever determined to be generous in the grand manner and start the simple-minded couple in married life on a scale befitting the general situation. You'll soon be clearing out of this place, I expect, he began cautiously. Clearing out? Cissy repeated. Why should we? We've got all we need. We haven't the slightest intention of trying to live as you live. Ozzy's very prudent, I'm glad to say, and so am I. We're going to save half for a few years, and then we shall see how things are. But you can't possibly stay on living in a place like this, Mr. Prohack protested, smiling diplomatically to soften the effect of his words. Who can't? You can't. But when you say me, do you mean your daughter or Ozzy's wife? Ozzy's lived here for years, and he's given lots of parties here, tea parties, of course. Mr. Brohack paused, perceiving that he had put himself in the wrong. This place is perfectly respectable, Cecilia continued, and supposing you haven't got all the money from America or somewhere, she persisted, would you have said that I couldn't possibly go on living in a place like this? She actually imitated his superior fatherly tone. You'd have been only too pleased to see me living in a place like this. Mr. Brohack raised both arms on high. "'All right,' said the young spouse, absurdly proud of her position. "'I'll let you off with your life this time, and you can drop your arms again. But if anybody had told me that you would come here and make a noise like a plutocrat, I wouldn't have believed it. Still, I'm frightfully fond of you, and I know you'd do anything for me, and you're nearly as much of a darling as Ozzy. But you mustn't be a rich man when you call on me here. I couldn't bear it twice.' "'I retire in disorder, closely pursued by the victorious enemy,' said Mr. Prohack. And in so saying he accurately described the situation. He had been more than defeated. He had been exquisitely snubbed. And yet the singular creature was quite pleased. He looked at the young girl, no longer his, and no longer a girl either. Set in the midst of a japanned and lacquered room that so resembled Ozzy in its daintiness, he saw the decision on her brow, the charm in her eyes, and the elegance in her figure and dress, and he came near to bursting with pride. She's got character enough to beat even me, he reflected contentedly, thus exhibiting an ingenuousness happily rare among fathers of brilliant daughters. And even the glimpse of the cupboard kitchen, where the washing up after a chafing dish breakfast for two had obviously not yet been accomplished, even this touch seemed only to intensify the moral and physical splendour of his child in her bridal setting. At the same time, he added to the admission of defeat, I seem to have a sort of idea that latterly you've been carrying on rather like a plutocrat's daughter. That was only my last fling, she replied, quite unperturbed. I see, said Mr. Prohack, musingly. Now, as regards my braiding present to you, 
Am I permitted to offer any gift, or is it forbidden? Of course, with all my billions, I couldn't hope to rival the gift which Ozzy gave you. But I might come in a pretty fair second, mightn't I? Dad, said she, I must leave all that to your good taste. I am sure that it won't let you make any attack on our independence. Supposing that I were to find some capital for Ozzy to start in business for himself as a theatrical manager. He must know a good deal about the job by this time. Sissy shook her delicious head. No, that would be plutocratic. And you see, I've only just married Ozzy. I don't know anything about him yet. When I do, I shall come and talk to you. While you're waiting, I wish you'd give me some crockery. One breakfast cup isn't quite enough for two people after the first day. I saw a set of things in a shop in Oxford Street for one pound, nineteen and six, which I should love to have. What's happened to the mater? Is she in a great state about me? Had you better run off and put her out of her misery? He went. Thoughtful. End of Part 1 of Chapter 21